It's great to see so many graph fanatics in the room. I think if we'd done this three or four years ago, I'd be talking to about five people. Um, it feels like we're really getting things going here. So I run uh, Refinitiv Labs. Um, we're a group of uh, data scientists, subject matter experts, data engineers, full stack engineers. Uh, we publish uh, cutting edge, edge research and we help our businesses experiment and validate new business opportunities using advanced technology. Uh, I'm a graph fanatic. I learned about graphs three or four years ago and I think it's going to change the world. It probably already has given how graphs are used by the likes of Facebook. Uh, we have four uh, labs uh, located in San Francisco, New York, London and Singapore and it's the Singapore team that have done a lot of the work on the risk graph which I'll be talking about uh, a bit later. We are hiring in New York and Singapore and London so if anyone's watching the live stream, uh, Refinitiv Labs, <laughs> we're hiring. So very quickly, the background. This is really important because this is how we've enabled to build probably one of the largest graphs uh, in, in the financial services industry. We have a very long legacy uh, in the financial data industry. We've been in business for 160 years and it started out literally uh, with Paul Julius Reuter using carrier pigeons uh, between Calais and Dover to transmit stock market quotes. Our open platform now supports a vast global ecosystem where content analytics and proprietary and customer data are all mixed and blended together. And today, Refinitiv, we were spun out from Thomson Reuters back in October. We're now uh, owned largely by Blackstone and some other private equity companies and pension funds. But at the heart of the business is still our news uh, product. We also have huge amounts of streaming and live data. My team have become experts in manipulating the vast amounts of data that we have. Uh, they're a little bit like master chefs. We have a huge pantry of ingredients, and what we do is we concoct, concoct amazing new dishes, and we take those out to our customers. They say, thank you very much. Can we have your ingredients, please? We want to try that ourselves. And that's a pattern we've seen in the graph space. So how did we get to uh, a knowledge graph? Well, it's been a long journey, as I say, and those ingredients um, have helped to bring all of this together. We have about 5,000 content experts who constantly create our content. We started out in news, but we quickly realized that actually organizing that news and making it semantically connected and searchable was one of our biggest, biggest challenges. So we acquired a company uh, called Clear Forest about 15 years ago, and Clear Forest were experts in the then nascent uh, natural language processing space. And out of the hundreds of sources of data, we also realized that we needed to scale how we made that data available to, com to, to, to customers. We were really struggling to build those products that could bring all of those disparate data sets together. So some very smart people came up with our data model, which we now live and breathe day in, day out. And a concept called the content marketplace was foundational to that. We heard a little bit earlier about how you get access to that data. What we did was we decided not to move the data. We not decided to remaster that data in situ. We um, applied um, a very tight controls around how we market that data. And every single information object across all of those databases have been remastered and connected together. So every information object has a perm ID, and that perm ID uh, intrinsically has created our semantic connections between our content. And we can now link unstructured and structured data because we've got our NLP capability, which is called intelligent tagging, and we have all of our tabular data mastered against perm IDs. In the process, we created a very large data, uh, database of linked data. And we thought this would help us build more and better new products. But actually, what we realized, with a little bit of education from my technology friends, that we built a huge knowledge graph, over 200 billion triples. And when I took a look at that as an Excel site analyst, I could start to see some of the insights that takes many, many years for an analyst to figure out how industries work, how industries are connected to people, how people are connected to products and markets. And there was born the knowledge graph. So we launched our intelligent tagging product and we opened up PermID in April 2015 
And about a year later, we started to make the Knowledge Graph feed available to customers. So what's at the core of our Knowledge Graph? Well, I assume everyone knows what a triple is, but here's the triple as we define it and where and how perm, is, perm IDs are applied. And at the atomic level, our information architecture remains beautifully simple. And even relationship types get a perm ID. So, so the predicates that relate to two nodes can also be uniquely identified. And individual relationships uh, are thereby assigned perm IDs. And you also notice that relationships can also be assigned with from, from, from and to uh, dates. So our knowledge graph is somewhat temporal. We can observe how the graph is evolving over time. And for those of you familiar with RDF, you'll see that our information model can be broken down into millions and millions of triples, and so are easily enabled uh, in big data environments. And why is this important? It and why is the perm ID important? It creates uh, very uh, high levels of precision in the graph. And as we all know, if you're not precise and you don't disambiguate those nodes, then you don't really have a graph. You have lots of fragmented graphs. So exciting news. We've got uh, version two of the graph about to be released. Uh, we launched the original graph a couple of years ago, as I said. Um, and it's really been gaining traction with customers. And it's, it's very uncomfortable, someone working at a company like Refinitiv, to be early with a product. We launched uh, Knowledge Graph before a lot of our customers knew what it was. I was pleased to see in the Gartner hype cycle that knowledge graphs are now actually on the hype cycle, so we're, we're going up that curve. Our V2 release is, uh, is coming out in the next month, and firstly, it's much bigger. Big graphs, more connections. We've added new relationship types like deals, and we've also improved the quality of our people and make some, made some adjustments to the underlying ontology. The Refinitive Knowledge Graph uh, uh, now delivers probably about three or four billion relationships. No one can really tell me because we haven't actually counted them. If you are a customer or looking to experiment with V2, uh, it will be available through an early access program and um, it will be free of charge. So um, if you're a customer, come and see me afterwards. So let's talk about some of the use cases. Uh, and this came in part from our own uh, experience and also uh, one of our partners, Neo4j, gave us some uh, useful input as well. So you can see that risk and KYC are accounting uh, for about 40% of the use cases that we're seeing. Um, I, think that, I think we had a number of risk use cases already from other speakers. In the next few slides, I'm going to be getting uh, more into what we've been doing in the Singapore lab. But very quickly on the investment management side, we're seeing a lot of NLP intergraph search and discover type applications. And there's also a lot of uh, applications emerging in master data management. We've had a very large asset manager just come to us recently saying that they want to model all of their assets around a knowledge graph and use our knowledge graph as the kind of foundational platform to do that. So let's talk about risk. Um, the first thing is there are some bad actors out there. And I apologize to Javier Bardem if he's uh, watching the stream. Uh, I actually think he's quite a good actor. Um, I think it's really funny if you look at this picture that there's a rack of computers, but there's no actual computers in the racks. So um, just a bunch of flashy, blinky lights. But uh, maybe he's in the cloud. Um, but seriously, um, a survey that we ran, I might have just, I'm missing a slide here, but I'll just run through the res results of a survey that we ran, which quantified the huge cost of these bad actors. The one that stood out for me was the cost of the industry of combating financial crime is about $1.3 trillion a year. And yet less than 1% of laundered money is detected by authorities, even though 86% passes through the banking system. And you can see from this slide, the costs are staggering and the headline costs are very important. And 72% of banks avoid the risk by simply avoiding customers that they think are risky. But just how do you make sense, make, make that assessment? Well, firstly, you start with a leading product called WorldCheck. WorldCheck is our sanctions database, and it tracks millions of bad actors, uh, real bad actors, not have people like Javier, and also millions of companies that have been sanctioned and be subject to 
enforcements around the world. It's an incredible database. But it's a very flat database. Where there is a link to an entity that is one of, in one of our databases of record, we master that linkage, um, obviously with a perm ID. And this means that theoretically we can connect bad people into our knowledge graph and into the uh, broader ecosystem. And this is what we're working on in the lab. So we've been testing a couple of hypotheses. Um, firstly, that an entity's association in a network to crime is positively correlated to its risk. And secondly, that an entity's subnetwork structure is also correlated to its risk. So as I mentioned, WorldCheck is currently the best tool we have today. And here we look directly individual. Here we look directly at the individual or the entity and see if they have any prior criminal sanction activity. But this assumes they have, they've, not, they've been caught. The idea here is to mix our knowledge graph with WorldCheck. So think of it this way. It's like taking your address book and systematically searching for and connecting all those contacts you've built over the years. And in a very short space of time, you'll have a lot of new or long lost friends from your past, incarnations of different phases in your life, firms you worked at, schools you went to, and these are the subnets. Many of those individuals in, uh, will not be in your address book. So let's start with a, simil a similar entry point. And actually, let's, let's zoom out a bit because I've got billions of nodes to show you. Actually, I'm only joking, we're not going to do a billion nodes. So here's the input into the knowledge graph. We've now connected into the knowledge graph. Um, and this is what you get back. Add world check, and you'll start to notice some entities that are tainted by their past. A person could be a pep or a politically exposed person. An entity could have been on a sanctions list or have been associated with human trafficking. And clearly, intuitively, the further away these pockets of crime are, uh, are from the subject, or you, the customer, the further away these, um, the, or the risk is that you're, uh, the individual is going to be associated with those activities. But how do you qualify this and assess when firms or people are riskier than others? You need to do some math. So concepts like centrality, some clever math exploited most notably by Facebook, plus the application of edge weightings allow you to create what we call an association score. It's not intended to definitively say whether an individual or company is itself involved in criminal activity, but it is a measure of proximity that can act as a red flag and prompt further investigation and checks. And most banks have investigation units and are starting to use knowledge graphs uh, in that way. The result, we believe, is the discovery of risks that would not have been previously found, it, found by simply searching for the entity in WorldCheck. So let's bring this together. So normally I'd jump into a demo, and we can demo this, but I'm not allowed to because you'd all have to be compliance officers uh, or I'd have to have your mind wiped as you leave the room. I'm not sure if we have the technology for that yet. So I've created some screenshots. Before we do that, I'm just going to give you a quick definition for those of you who don't know. And this is, these are kind of our definitions or our take on these definitions. So the first one is closeness which indicates the proximity through multiple short part, shortest paths. Degree, which is a measure of how connected an entity is in its network. And betweenness is a measure of how often an entity shows up on the shortest path. So you can see I've, uh, I've blurred out some of the names, just to keep you all honest, so we don't have to, um, we don't have to uh, blank your, your minds. Unfortunately, we can't quite see the vertices. Um, so what we're looking at here is a network of high-profile companies and individuals in a country somewhere in the world. The larger graph, which is down there on the right, um, if we zoom in, this is the graph that you get. So the first thing is, only applying centrality measures, we can identify entity X as a very influ influential node. And we see that it's a bridge and also a hub to the whole network. Other influential nodes are entities A through D, and basically it denotes that these nodes have high influence within the network. And now we overlay risk data on this graph, we can see that four of them 
uh, four of them uh, with high influence have been identified as bad actors uh, based on various offences relating to collusion price, and price fixing. And this uh, took place um, between 2001 and 2008. All were fined for these validation, uh, violations, which is how we picked up and the data ended up in World Check. Make sure I've got the right version here. Now, uh, looking at the identified crime nodes in the subgraph, the four companies that were involved in financial crime and an additional company, Entity E, maybe that's on the next slide, Entity E uh, was also fined for price fixing. And we now use association scoring to identify entities that are potentially more risky on account of their association to the black nodes. And based on association score, which looks at relationships, proximity to crime nodes, and centrality, we can identify entities F, G, and H uh, to have high scores, thus potentially high risk. Stay with me, we're nearly done. OK. So it's verified later that five out of the six red entities were then involved in similar financial crimes with regards to collusion and price fixing. Thus, in this scenario, we can see that we can use graphs and centrality measures to evaluate, evaluate unidentified risk from known risk variables. It can, at times, like in this example, have predictive indicators, but at the very least, it helps evaluate heightened risk by association be it direct or indirect, reputation, business dependency, uh, and so on. So I thought I'd very quickly show you um, the secret source. This is patent pending. Um, that's the end of my formal presentation. I think we've probably pretty much run our course, but if you've got any uh, questions, that might be an option. From your last example of tracking down bad actors, I sort of felt like there's a next step you could do of becoming basically data journalists and finding a smoking gun and turning this over to, I don't know, the Times, the Post, or well, whatever. Is that an ambition you have, or has that already happened? You simply can't tell us about it. Just well, be quiet and nod if you're not yeah. allowed to tell us about it. So the first thing is that WorldCheck and the analytics we're building on WorldCheck are specifically for financial, uh, for a license to banks to fight financial crime. Um, many of you will be fam familiar with the work that Neo4j did with the ICIJ and the Panama Papers, which is a great example of how graphs can find hidden connections. I think what was interesting with, with that exercise was it was looking within a closed database of bad actors. I think what's interesting is we found that when you connect those bad actors to the global ecosystem, you find a lot of hidden connections. Um, and we're working with a couple of regulators who have frankly, being gobsmacked by some of the things that they, you know, we've shown them. But that is all very internal and specifically for those use cases. So unfortunately, we're not leaking anything to the press. We don't do that. So thank you very much. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, comparables um, that you detect algorithmically in one of your slides. How yes. you detect them? Like, can you give some insight about that? And relation to the graphs? Yeah, so we apply, and unfortunately I couldn't, the, the algorithm was fuzzed out, it wasn't completely blank, but we apply, um, we basically, I think one of the other speakers was talking about edge weightings, so we apply different weightings, we actually allow our customers to, to set those weightings. So if a customer is more sensitive to a certain type of financial crime, they can give those edges a higher weighting. And then we also use those centrality measures to be able to identify and score every individual entity in a graph. What this ultimately will allow a customer to do is, as well as when they onboard a new customer, they'll be able to con uh, constantly re-rank their customer base against uh, this, um, this, th this overall score. I actually think that what will happen is that customers will want to blend in their own customer data, maybe other sanctions lists, to cr and, and to actually modify um, the algorithms themselves. So I mentioned, um, you know, a bit like master chefs in the lab. I think, you know, customers, especially the biggest customers, will be baking their own, you know, version of the risk graph. But um, the math's pretty complicated, and I can certainly get you in front of a couple of our data scientists to, to get into that detail if that's of interest. <laughs>